Okay, I'm going to get started this morning by just welcoming all of you guys. Sawadee Khab, welcome to Wat Tung Yu. Welcome to all of you guys here. And welcome to everyone online who's joining us as well. This is our group learning program. And we just restarted this program about five weeks ago or so. It's a seven-month program where I guide you through developing a foundational practice in the teachings of the Buddha to help you get to the enlightened mental state. What enlightenment is, is where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. You no longer experience any anger, sadness, frustration frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, all these discontent feelings and others are eliminated. You'll notice increased qualities of the mind. You'll notice focus, concentration, clarity of mind, deep memory. Your personal professional relationships will really blossom because you're not being hostile and harsh and bitter in your relationships any longer. And this comes through transforming your mind. The teachings of the Buddha is not about believing a bunch of things and then hoping something good happens when you die. Instead, you're learning teachings, you're reflecting on those to end independently verify them, and then you're practicing them in order to train your mind and transform the mind. The Buddha discovered some individual pollutions that are in the mind, and he provided the tools and the techniques of how to uproot those out of the mind so that you can experience the peace and joy of the enlightened mind. So we start each one of our classes with meditation because this is one of the trainings, one of the tools and techniques that the Buddha shared in order to help you get to enlightenment. But there's other things you would need as well besides just meditation. So after our meditation, I'm going to transition over to a talk that I will share with you guys today, which is chapter one of our book that we're using for this program. The seven month program, we use a book called Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This is part of the words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden Book Series. And you can actually get this book free online. You can download it. You can take it and go print it. You can get printed versions here at the temple, or you can order them on Amazon. If you'd like to gradually learn and develop your life practice, this is a great program for people who are just getting started. So if you're done with the anger and the sadness and frustration and you're ready to get to peace and joy, the teachings of the Buddha are there for you to help you gradually learn and develop. And all the teachings and classes, courses, retreats, and resources are available at no cost, even personal guidance. You can receive personal guidance available at no cost. So if you'd like to join for meditation, the way that I start this is I start with a chant in order to ease the mind into meditation. And we have the chant on a laminated sheet over there on the table. You can see See the chanting that we do. It's in the Pali language. This is the original language of the teachings of the Buddha. When you're doing these chants, it's to help you get more benefit out of the meditation itself. It's to help ease the mind into meditation. These aren't a rite, a ritual, or a ceremony, or worship. They're not prayer or anything like that. If you read the translations of the chants, you'll see there's a lot of admiration and respect for the Buddha. This, I suspect that his students created these chants either during his life or after his death as a way of showing their gratitude to the Buddha for helping them move from this anger and sadness and frustration to this peace and joy that is the enlightened mind. So these chants that we do, it's not a way to worship the Buddha or anything like that. It's a way to help you gain awareness of the mind and awareness of breath as you ease into meditation. During the lifetime of the Buddha, he used chanting as a way to help his students commit the teachings to memory because all of his teachings were oral. They didn't write things down during his lifetime because the technology didn't exist in that region of the world to actually write things down. So everything that he taught was oral. So every two weeks they would recite his teachings word for word by chanting them. So that's how chanting came about. So there's no mystical or magical benefits here. There's not prayer or worship or anything like that in the teachings of the Buddha. Instead, you're learning, you're reflecting to independently verify his teachings that they're true. And then you're practicing the teachings in order to train your mind. You're not doing rites and rituals and ceremonies and worship in the teachings of the Buddha. Even though there are some places that might do those things and attribute them to the Buddha, the Buddha never actually taught any of those things. So these chants are there to help you get more benefit out of the meditation if you'd like to use them. So I'll start with that to chant in ease into meditation and you're welcome to join along as I do that. Then once we're in meditation, I'll be guiding you for a period of time. You just hear me kind of guiding you and instructing you about meditation and how to do meditation. Then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet and we'll all be meditating together. Those of us here at the temple and those of you online will just all be meditating together. And I'm sure you'll hear an occasional noise here or there. You might hear a sound of a car going by or dog barking or a bird chirping or something like this. But all these things are impermanent. You can just train your mind to let that go and not crave for a certain sound or, or no sound at all because 
all these things are impermanent. You're going to hear occasional sounds. There's nowhere that you can meditate that's going to be permanently quiet. It's just not possible. And then after we do our meditation, then we're going to come out of that meditation with some more chanting. And then that's where I'll transition over to sharing some teachings with you from chapter one of this book series. In terms of the body positioning for meditation, the Buddha taught four different positions. He taught seated, lying, standing, and walking position. And when you're first learning, oftentimes people learn in the seated position. So I'll give you some guidance on seated position and then to understand that there's other positions as well. And then also understand that it's not about everybody sitting in exactly the same way because all of our bodies are different. We're going to find different things to be comfortable. So if you're on the floor, you might just sit with your legs lightly crossed. If you have them real tight, this will tend to impede the circulation and cause pain in the lower body. So you'd like your legs to just be lightly crossed. Some people like to put their legs off the mat. This gets the hips up in the air and it lessens the angle at the hips, the knees and the ankles. So some people prefer to do it that way. Your hands and your arms, you might decide to put your right hand over your left with your thumbs together. This is the way that the Buddha did it. But again, it's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way because this isn't actually possible. So you need to find what's comfortable for you. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or their knees, their palms up. Some people just rest their hands in their lap. So your lower body and hands and arms should be completely relaxed. And for anybody who's sitting in a chair or on a sofa or on a bench, you can maybe just sit with your feet flat on the floor or lightly cross at the ankles. And then again, your hands are comfortable wherever you find them to be comfortable. So you just sit however you're comfortable. The upper body should be erect. By having the upper body erect, this keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation so that you can actively train the mind. During meditation, it's not a time to zone out and take a nap or anything like that. You're actively training the mind during the meditation. So you would like the mind to be attentive and alert during the meditation. So by having the upper body erect, it keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. It also helps you to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose because you'll have your sternum up and your shoulders back and this helps you to breathe in through the lungs and really fully expand your lungs. So again, I'm going to ease into meditation with chanting that you're welcome to join in and then I'll be back with some guidance to help you in meditation. สัมมาสัมพุทโธมะเขวะโอตังมะเขวะนังอภิวาเตยมีสวัสดิ์ขะโตมะเขวะตาดัมโม Namang namasami Supati pano mahakewato Sawaka sanko Sankang namami Napmur hasa pakawato arato sama samputasa Napmur hasa pakawato Arato Sama Samputasa Napmur Sapakawato Arato Sama Samputasa Iti piso makawa arahan sa masamuto wichacaran ang samuno sa katoro kawito. Anu tero purisa nama 
สัตติสัตตาวะมานุสนังโอตุภะคะวะตเคว่าตัว lower body and hands and arms comfortable in the upper body erect just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose here you're just looking to establish the breath a nice natural steady consistent breath Not forced or controlled, just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then, when you're ready, exhale out through the nose, breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing. And that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to your next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath, and then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Experiencing the full breath, breathing in and out, breathing in. And out. Once the breath is well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose, or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. And out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it. Or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. 
I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. And out.
slowly make your way out of meditation. Once again, I just welcome all of you guys that are here. Those of you guys joining us online, welcome to everyone, including those of you guys that joined us since we started meditating. Welcome to everyone. For those of you guys that it's your first time here at the temple, I'd just like to share a couple of things to help you feel more comfortable is that in the back of the room, we have a bathroom, the very last door on the right. You're welcome to use that at any time. There's even bathrooms outside the classroom. If you go outside and you'll follow the main signs around to the main temple bathroom, you'll see other bathrooms over there as well. We even have water and there are snacks here that the students typically provide. So you guys are welcome to help yourself to any water or snacks or anything that you see. Just make yourself comfortable as you learn the teachings of the Buddha. This meditation that we just did, it's called breathing mindfulness meditation. The goal of this meditation is to help you cultivate mindfulness or awareness of mind and concentration. These are wholesome qualities that you're going to need in order to make your way to enlightenment is where you're aware of what's going on in the mind so that you can purify the mind and you're going to need concentration or focus and clarity as well. And then you're also training your mind to let go, eliminate craving, desire, attachment, that in the unenlightened state, the minds tend to hold on. It's holding on and holding on and holding on. This is called craving, desire, attachment. This is the mental longing and strong eagerness. This is the mind chasing after the objects of its affection, thinking that the next new shiny object waiting around the corner is going to provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. So the mind chases and chases and chases. And if you get what you want, you get pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. These are very pleasant feelings to experience, but those feelings are only temporary because they're based on some condition. Those feelings, they arise, they change, and they fade away. And if you get what you want, you're going to get those pleasant feelings, but ultimately it's going to lead you 
feeling dissatisfied because those feelings are only temporary. And then when you don't get what you want or those feelings fade away, your mind moves to the painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. These are all very painful for the mind to experience. And this is all coming from the mind itself. It's the craving, the desire, the attachment. It's the longing, the yearning, the wanting things to be a certain way, the expecting things to be a certain way. And when things meet your expectations, you're happy and you're excited. But when things don't meet your expectations, you experience the painful feelings like sadness, anger, and others. So oftentimes in the unenlightened state with a lack of wisdom, we think what What's causing the anger is somebody else or something external. So you might blame other people for causing you to be angry or causing you to be frustrated. But this is actually part of the mind's lack of wisdom in the unenlightened state is that it thinks that something external is causing your inner feelings when in reality your mind is causing these feelings itself. And when you experience these painful feelings, they're uncomfortable for the mind. So the unenlightened mind falsely understanding what the real problem is will tend to push people away out of your life. You might have done this where you push people away or you push a situation away and you think that this is going to solve the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem because it's only a matter of time before you get agitated or annoyed or frustrated about something else. If that solved the problem, when you push those people out of your life, you wouldn't get angry or frustrated anymore. But since that's not the real problem, when you push them out of your life, you still get angry. You still get frustrated. You still get annoyed because it's inside your mind that's causing this. It's craving, desire, attachment. The other thing that the unenlightened mind will do when it falsely understands what's going on is when it's attributing its painful feelings to something external, you will tend to be bitter and harsh and hostile and aggressive towards other people. It's almost like an animal showing its teeth or growling or roaring, trying to get this person to do things your way. And the unenlightened mind thinks that if I am bitter, harsh and hostile with this person, I'll show them that they're the ones who are making me angry and now they will change their behavior. But that's not going to work. That's not what's actually causing your mind to be discontent. It's not something external. Or or the third thing that the unenlightened mind will do is it'll tend to put your expectations on people, maybe trying to pressure people or control people to do things your way. This is the unenlightened mind just not understanding the true problem, which is craving, desire, attachment, the longing, the yearning, the chasing after the objects of your affection, the mind pulling towards something, thinking the next new shiny object is going to provide lasting satisfaction. So if you crave for it to be sunny, when you see that it's sunny, you'll be happy and you'll be excited. But then when that changes, because the sun is impermanent, your mind craving permanence, you want this sun to be permanent. When you see it's raining, you'll be sad or you'll be frustrated. You'll be irritated. Or if your bank account is a certain balance, you'll be happy. You'll be excited. But then when the bank account drops, you'll be sad or frustrated or irritated or annoyed. Or if mom and dad do this, you'll be happy and excited. But if mom and dad do this, you'll be frustrated and agitated or annoyed. This is what the unenlightened mind does, that it has craving, desire, attachment. You're not a bad person. You haven't necessarily done anything wrong. It's just that the mind lacks wisdom and it has these pollutions that the Buddha discovered, namely this first one that I'm talking about is craving, desire, attachment. And the only reason why I'm talking about it is because this is where someone would normally get started on the path to enlightenment is to start to understand that it's your own mind that's causing these discontent feelings. Because as long as you believe that it's something external that's causing your inner feelings, you'll never solve your problem. You'll just continue to be angry and frustrated and sad the rest of your life. But when you start to be able to independently verify the teachings and see the truth for yourself, that it's craving, desire, attachment that's causing these feelings, and there's tools and techniques to be able to help you eliminate these causes and conditions so that you can get to the peace and joy, that if you understand what the real problem is and what the cause of that problem is, then when you apply the solutions, then you'll actually see real results. But as long as you don't understand what the real problem is and what's causing that problem, then you'll continue to struggle and have difficulties in the world. So this meditation, a breathing mindfulness meditation is a primary training to train your mind to let go. Because with craving, desire, attachment, you'll hold on to things, wanting things to be a certain way. And if people do things your way, you'll be happy. And if they don't do things your way, you'll be sad or frustrated or angry or some other discontent feeling. And because there's 8 billion people in the world, they're not going to all do things your way. And they're not all going to do things exactly 
exactly the same way. It's not possible for every single human being to do things exactly the same way. So the teachings of the Buddha, it's not about a bunch of rules and commandments that if everybody follows these rules then the world will become peaceful. That's not what his teachings are. His teachings are explaining to you not the way the world should be, but he's explaining to you the way the world is. And he's helping you to understand, among other things, that your mind has certain pollutions there and it's craving for things to be permanent when in reality everything around you is impermanent. The sun is impermanent, your bank account's impermanent, this body is impermanent, all your relationships are impermanent, people are coming and going in and out of your life, but if you cling and you hold on to these things, wanting them to be permanent, when they start changing, your mind will struggle and you'll have anger and sadness and frustration. So this meditation, a breathing mindfulness meditation, it's not to train your mind to eliminate your thoughts. Sometimes people think that if their mind's on the breath and your mind moves off the breath, that somehow you're bad at meditation, but this isn't actually true. You're never going to eliminate your thoughts. You're going to have thoughts in your day-to-day life. The problem isn't that you're having thoughts. The problem is that the mind has certain unwholesome thoughts or a bombardment of thoughts, or you might indulge in certain unwise thoughts. So this meditation is to train your mind that to notice sooner and sooner when you have a thought and then to be able to easily let it go. So in the unenlightened state, what you might have experienced during your meditation is a bombardment of thoughts, lots of rapid thoughts. This is very common. Or you might have had an indulging of a thought where you had a thought, you indulge in that for maybe two or three minutes, and then you realize like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm meditating. Let me bring my mind back to the breath, right? So this is very common as your first learning meditation. But as you train your mind more and more and it becomes more disciplined, you'll be able to see the thought sooner and sooner. That's your mindfulness or awareness of mind. Be able to be aware of that thought sooner and sooner and be able to concentrate on the breath. But when the mind does move off the breath, easier and easier, you'll be able to cut that off and let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. Even in the enlightened mental state, you're going to have occasional thoughts. Your mind will be quieted, it'll be stilled, but you'll still have occasional thoughts. Where in the unenlightened state, you'll have thought, 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 thought. Where in the enlightened state, you'll have a thought, you'll notice it, you'll cut it off and bring the mind back to the breath, and then the mind will be quiet and still for a period of time. And then you'll eventually have another thought. You'll notice that and then you'll be able to cut that off and let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. So your goal in this meditation isn't to eliminate your thoughts. You're going to always have thoughts. As long as you're alive, you'll have thoughts. But what you're doing is you're training the mind to have that mindfulness and concentration, that awareness of mind and to be able to focus and to be able to easily let go. So in meditation, you're training your mind to cut off anything and everything that comes up because you're trying to build these qualities of mindfulness, concentration, and eliminate craving, desire, attachment, where your mind's easily able to let go. But then in daily life, when you're out and about, you're only cutting off the unwholesome thoughts. In daily life, if you have a wholesome thought, go forward, right? You would like to take your friend to lunch or call up your mom and check in on her and see how she's doing. There's no harm in that. Go ahead, right? We're training in one way in meditation, but we're practicing in daily life in a different way, that you're only cutting off unwholesome thoughts. So when you're out and about and you're noticing the frustration starting to build and you're noticing those bodily sensations of the anger starting to come up and your face is feeling hot, you feel pressure in the skull, you feel tightening in the chest or in the throat, If you've been training in meditation the way that I'm describing, you can cut that off and let it go. You can preserve your mind of not having to experience anger. You're not suppressing your thoughts. You're cutting them off. You're cutting these feelings off before they even become a feeling. You're cutting it off at the bodily sensations. So you're training your mind in one way and you're practicing in a different way, which is cutting off any kind of unwholesome thoughts. And this is similar to what a professional athlete would do. A professional athlete would go into the gym and train in one way. Like if I was a pole vaulter, I might do weight training, cardiovascular training, agility training. But then when I go do my sport, It looks very different than what I was doing in the gym. So you're training in the gym and exercising the body in one way, and then you're using the body, using those qualities that you built during the exercise, you're using those qualities to accomplish something wonderful, like being a great pole vaulter. So it's the same thing as when you're training your mind, you're building certain qualities that you then use during day-to-day life. And just like you clean this body every day, 
You need to clean the mind every day with meditation. It's the same thing that you have this activity to be able to train your mind and clean it up so that eventually by the time you get to enlightenment, your mind's completely purified. And there's an entire path that the Buddha teaches that will fully purify the mind and help you be able to experience the peace and joy. And that starts with understanding what's actually causing these discontent feelings, that the problem in the unenlightened mind are these discontent feelings, these conditional feelings. Even the conditional happiness is just conditional. It arises, it changes, and it fades away, ultimately feeling dissatisfied. And the painful feelings, the same thing. They arise, they change, and they fade away. But you can get to a point where you have unconditioned mental states where the mind is just always peaceful. It's always joyful. It's always focused. It's always concentrated. You're always in a good mood by the time you get to enlightenment because you've uprooted the causes and conditions that are producing these disconsent feelings. And this would be the enlightened mental state that you get to this unconditioned mental state where the mind's always peaceful and always joyful, right? So this is just a little bit for you about what this meditation is and why we practice it. We practice it regularly throughout our day. You would like to gradually build up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And right now that probably sounds like a lot, depending on what you've got going on in your life to do two or three sessions for 30 minutes or more sounds like probably a lot. And that's why you need gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. You can't just snap your fingers and instantly do two or three sessions for 30 minutes or more. You would like to gradually build up to that. It could take you six months, a year, even two years to gradually build up to that. But if you do gradually build up to that over time, the meditation with all the other teachings, you'll gradually see the condition of the mind improving. As I shared, the teachings of the Buddha, it's not about a bunch of beliefs and then hoping something good happens when you die. It's about learning now, reflecting now to independently verify his teachings and practicing them now in this life. And because of that, you see the results now now in this life, you see your mind becoming more peaceful and joyful because in situations where you know that you typically get angry and frustrated and agitated, those same situations will be occurring and you don't get angry and you don't get frustrated and you'll know that it's these teachings that are helping you to accomplish that. So I'll see if you guys have any questions about meditation because I know some of you guys are building up your meditation practice and I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions either here at the temple or those of you guys online. And then afterwards, I'll move into our discussion about the first chapter of our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. If you guys would like to ask questions here at the temple, we have microphones here in the front in the white bowl. If you could just get one of those, press the gray button, you'll see the lights come on and just wait a second or two and hold it up to your chin. We'll be able to hear you at the temple and they'll be able to hear you online as well. And for those of you guys online, if you guys would like to ask questions, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section and I'll be able to see that and answer your question. And then if you're in Zoom, you can also electronically raise your hand and open up your mic and we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you on the live stream as well. So are there any questions here about meditation that you guys might have before we move into our discussion today? No questions? Okay. Let me see if we have anything online. All right. I'm not seeing anything online either. Okay. So let's move into our discussion today, which is about this first chapter of our book. This first chapter of our book, it's titled Universal Teachings, Love, No Harm, and Good Morals. And sometimes people ask, you know, why is this the first chapter? Why is it that you're sharing these teachings of these universal teachings? Well, what you're going to find with these universal teachings and what I share in this first chapter is that what I'm helping people do to do is understand that all these various traditions that we have in the world, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, Judaism, or anything else that you've seen out there, all of these teachings and all these traditions are essentially guiding individuals to becoming a better and better person. And there are certain commonalities amongst all these teachings. Sometimes what people like to do is they get into their camps and they talk about all the things that are different and they fight and argue over who's right and who's wrong. Well, when I look at all these different traditions, I like to look at the commonalities and the similarities because you'll see a lot of similarities between a lot of these teachings. You'll see these universal teachings that are taught in all these different traditions, that there's this universal love for all beings that you're, that they'll teach, you know, in all these different traditions to have love for all beings, that you can have this unconditional love where you're not wanting or expecting people to be a certain way. And then there's this 
teaching of do no harm because any harm that you're causing to others, this harm is going to come back to you. And then there's a certain aspect of teachings amongst all these traditions of having good morals and having good moral conduct because it's that moral conduct that if you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results for you. The Buddha referred to this as the natural law of gamma or some people refer to it as karma. This isn't punishments or rewards or mystical or magical or anything like that. It's not about who's to blame or who's at fault. It's literally about seeing this cause and effect or this action and result. That is, you make wise decisions about your moral conduct and you make those decisions and put those out, then you'll experience wholesome results coming back to you or wholesome gamma coming back to you. But when you make unwise decisions about your moral conduct and you put that out, it's injuring other beings, it's causing harm, so therefore harm is going to come back to you. And when we experience certain things in our life, in the unenlightened state with a lack of wisdom of this natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result, we will tend to blame what we experience on other people. We will tend to think it's either good luck or bad luck or destiny or fate or somebody else is causing what you're experiencing. But more and more, when you look closely at the teachings of the Buddha and all these other teachers, you can see that you're either making wise decisions that are producing wholesome results or unwise decisions that are producing unwholesome results. But when you lack wisdom about this natural law, you'll tend to think that whatever you're experiencing in life that is unwholesome is coming from other people. But this isn't actually the truth. And you can see that anything that you're experiencing, either wholesome or unwholesome, it's a result of decisions that you're making. But if you kept blaming other people for what it is that you're experiencing, you'll never have the opportunity to cultivate wisdom, make different decisions, and experience different results. So this will keep you stuck if you don't look at the natural laws closely and see that what you're experiencing is a result of your decisions. If you kept blaming other people, then you'll keep staying stuck and experiencing these same things over and over and over again. So if you're noticing in your life, you keep experiencing the same things over and over, like broken relationships or arguments and hostility and bitterness and things like this keeps happening over and over in your life. This is from decisions that you're making. And when you cultivate wisdom in your life and you cultivate the understanding of how to train your mind, you can escape all of this. You can get to a point where you understand that what you're experiencing is a result of decisions that you're making, cultivate more wisdom, and then improve your decision making and experience improved results. So these universal teachings will help you to see this commonality among all these different traditions. It'll help you to see how clear the teachings of the Buddha are is that they're not to be interpreted. The teachings of the Buddha, you're not interpreting his teachings and trying to figure them out because he talked very clear, he talked very concise and very precise. And it can help provide you this bridge from whatever it is that you learned as you were growing up as a child, or if you didn't learn any teachings at all growing up as a child, you can see that whatever you learned growing up whether it was from grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, or aunts and uncles, or whether it was from a church or a synagogue or a temple or a mosque or something like this, those teachings all helped you to get to where you are today in life. But if you're still experiencing anger and sadness and agitation and frustration and all these other discontent feelings, the mind hasn't yet been fully purified and you're not yet enlightened. So you can use those teachings that you've learned in your past and think about them as a bridge that's helped you to move to where you are today. And now you can add in teachings of the Buddha to be able to help you see how to move your mind to this enlightened mental state. That sometimes people feel like they're maybe turning their back on the teachings from their childhood. And I don't suggest that you think of it that way. If you grew up with Christian teachings or Muslim teachings or Hindu teachings or any other teachings or no teachings at all, just maybe from grandma and grandpa, those are all building blocks. And those are all foundational things that helped you to get to where you are today in life. But if you're interested in going further and beyond that and continuing to move towards a higher consciousness, the teachings of the Buddha are there for you. And you can see these as a bridge to help you move towards a better and better improved condition of your mind in an improved condition of your life. So this is something that you can think about with the teachings of the Buddha that they're going to help you to be able to move and evolve to a better and better human being and move to this higher consciousness. And that you can use these universal teachings as a way to look at it as a bridge and building blocks to move to the next thing. 
another thing that you can think about with these universal teachings is that if all else fails and you totally forget and blank about what you should potentially do in any one given situation, you can look to the universal teachings and say, am I sharing my love here? Am I causing any harm? Am I practicing good morals? This can be something for you to fall back on. The teachings of the Buddha, they're not rules. They're not commandments. There's not a decision tree that if this happens, do that. And if this happens, do that, right? There's not just one permanent answer of what you should or shouldn't do in any one given situation you're going to need to cultivate wisdom and move to a higher consciousness where you're consciously making decisions about what you choose to do in the world or choose to not do in the world. And through your wise decision-making, you'll experience wholesome results. And through your unwise decision-making, you'll experience unwholesome results. But when you're in a situation where you're having difficulties to know what would be the wise decision and you don't have the ability to maybe reach out to your teacher or a friend or family member or something like that, and you need to make a decision, you can look to these universal teachers as a way to support your decision making. That if you're practicing love, that you're not causing harm and you're practicing good morals, this will ensure that you're producing wholesome results in your life. So I'm going to share with you what these three universal teachings are. There's universal love for all beings. This is where you practice loving kindness and compassion for all beings. This is the way the Buddha would have described it, right? But if you look at Christian teachings, Jesus would have said, love thy neighbor, right? Different teachers say, say things in a different way, but they're communicating the same message is to have love and kindness and compassion for all beings. What loving kindness is, is active goodwill for all beings without judgment, a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, because the opposite of loving kindness is anger and hate and frustration and annoyance and dislike. By the time you get to enlightenment, you won't even dislike another being. Right now, that's probably very challenging for you. There's probably certain people in your life that you like, and there's probably certain people that you dislike. And this is what the unenlightened mind does when it has craving, desire, attachment. It wants people to be a certain way. And when people aren't that way, you dislike them right? You only like these people who do things the way that you like, right? But when these people do certain things, you don't like them and you, your mind might want to push them away. But by the time you purify your mind of any craving, desire, attachment, and any anger, hatred, ill will, frustration, agitation, annoyance, you can get to the point where you have love and kindness for all beings, that you're not expecting them to be a certain way. You're not wanting them to be a certain way. Understanding that everybody in life has had different experiences than you, and you're not going to agree with everything that everyone does. And you can separate the individual from the decisions that they make, that you can disagree with someone's decisions. You can disagree with their choices and decisions while still loving the person. Where sometimes people think that if I disagree with this person's decisions, I can't like them anymore. I can't love them anymore because I don't agree with their decisions. But that's not actual love. That's the craving, the desire, the attachment, the longing, the yearning, the wanting, the expecting this person to be a certain way. And now the mind says, I can only love this person if they do things my way. But that's not love. That's not unconditional love. That's craving, desire, attachment masquerading as love. That's wants and expectations masquerading as love. What true love is, is this loving kindness is unconditional love, where you love all beings as they are, not wanting them to be a certain way, not expecting them to be a certain way, not casting your expectations on them and what you want for that person, understanding that everybody's had different experiences in life, and of course they're going to make different decisions than you. There's only one person who you're going to agree with 100% of the time. Do you know who that person is? Yourself. Yourself, right? That's the only person you're ever going to agree with 100% of the time. So if you can only love people who you agree with, you're only going to love yourself, right? And you might even have challenges with that in the unenlightened state. You might have difficulties loving yourself. You might have a negative self-talk or diminishing and degrading thoughts within your own mind. So if you can only agree with yourself and you can only love people who you agree with and you can only love yourself. So if you can understand that you're going to disagree with decisions mom and dad makes because they've had different experiences than you in life, your brothers and sisters, same thing, even though you guys grew up together, 
they have had different experiences in life than you. You're not going to agree with them all the time. Same thing with your life partner, your children, your boss, your colleagues and your coworkers. You're not going to agree with these people all the time. But them making different decisions doesn't mean you need to hate them or that they've done anything wrong. It's just that they're making different choices and decisions than you. And you can still love the person while disagreeing with their choices and decisions. And this is getting you closer and closer to unconditional love, where you just love somebody as they are, free of your expectations and wanting them to be a certain way. And this would be to have loving kindness for all beings, that you have a genuine interest in seeing them be well, but understanding that them being well is a result of their decisions. It's not a result of your decisions. You're not responsible for mom being well or dad being well, or brothers and sisters, or anybody else. Everybody's responsible for their own wellness, right? But if you're putting your expectations on someone, this is attempting to control somebody or trying to force them to do things your way. This isn't having genuine interest in seeing them be well. Because you know you don't like it when people try to force you or control you to do something. But the mind doesn't think about that when you're trying to control other people or you're trying to put your expectations on other people. Oftentimes we think that because of the ego that's in the mind, we think that we know what's best and everybody should do it our way, right? And if everyone does it our way, the world would be perfect but there's 8 billion people in the world. They're not gonna all do it your way, right? So if you have genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, and you're practicing this loving kindness where you have goodwill towards others without judgment, then you wouldn't put your expectations on people and you wouldn't control other people. But with your craving, your desire, your attachment, that makes it hard for you to do that because your mind wants things to be a certain way. So that's why you need certain training to knock down the craving. Now notice here when I talk about loving kindness, it's a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, active goodwill without judgment. What judgment is, is where you're judging people and trying to determine, do they deserve my loving kindness or not? And if they're loving and kind to me, then I judge them as they deserve my loving kindness and I will be loving and kind with them. But this isn't going to lead you to improved relationships and this enlightened mental state. If you're judging others and putting yourself above people or below either other people, oftentimes we're taught don't respect others until they respect you. Well, if everybody was doing this with respect and with love, that I'm not going to love you until you love me, or I'm not going to respect you until you respect me. If everybody was practicing that in the world, nobody would be respecting anybody. Nobody would be loving anybody because everybody's waiting for everybody else to be the first one to be respectful or everyone else is waiting for the first person to be loving and kind. So as an enlightened being, someone who's getting to enlightenment, you're not going to conform to what other people are doing. You're not going to follow other people. You're going to see the wisdom behind you being loving and kind is a wise decision for you and you being respectful is a wise decision for you. If other people choose to be disrespectful, if other people choose to have hatred and anger, that's their choice and it's affecting them. But you can train your mind not to be affected by what other people are choosing to do. Right now, again, you might find that challenging, but this is something you can work towards. But if you have judgment where you're only being loving and kind, if other people are being loving and kind, you're conforming to other people, you're following what other people do. You need to rise above that and realize that Whenever you're loving and kind, this is very beneficial for you. It's a wise decision. It's going to promote wholesome results in your life. And the same thing is true about compassion. Compassion is the concern for the misfortune of others. Sometimes when you see somebody in an unfortunate situation, you might feel painful feelings. If you have craving, desire, you want everybody in the world to be a certain way, you, when you see someone struggling with poverty or famine or some injury or they're homeless or maybe a drug addiction or something like this, you might be sad. This is because the mind's craving permanence, wanting everybody to be a certain way. You may be taking responsibility for other people's wellness when each individual needs to be responsible for their own wellness. But also if you were on the other side of the spectrum where you were indifferent and you could care less how other people experience life and what they did and what they experienced, you wouldn't feel peace and joy there either. So coming to the middle with this teaching of universal love for all beings and practicing compassion is to have concern for the misfortune of others, but realize that you're not responsible 
to be able to solve other people's misfortune. They need to be responsible for that. In situations where you can help people, surely help people, right? If that's what you're able to do. You can practice loving kindness, compassion, generosity, and this will really help you and it'll help those people too. But in some situations, you're not gonna be able to help people, right? But no matter what, even if you're helping somebody, their wellness is their responsibility. It's not your responsibility. So compassion isn't to long and yearn and crave for other people to be a certain way, but it's also not to be indifferent and care less. So the way to get away from the worry and anxiety about all the struggles and difficulties in the world is to realize that you can move your mind to this middle way where you're practicing compassion, which is concern for the misfortune of others, where you just have concern for them. And you may or may not take action to help them in any particular situation. You're not gonna always be able to help people in every single situation. And then even when you're helping, realize that they are responsible for their own peacefulness, their own contentedness, their own joy. When mom is upset or dad is angry, you're not responsible for that they're causing that themselves, right? They may not realize that, but they're actually causing those frustrated feelings themselves. So you can move your mind to this loving kindness and this compassion that you're practicing this universal teaching of love all beings, this universal love for all beings, where you have a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. And this will help to motivate the other aspects of these universal teachings of do no harm because you're not interested in causing harm to others. And if you have loving kindness and compassion, it'll be easier for you to cultivate this thinking or this thought or this intention behind practicing non-ill will and harmlessness because everything else that you learn on the path to enlightenment is kind of built on this idea of you causing harm to others, this harm is gonna come to you. And you can see the truth for yourself that when you've done lying or slander or gossip or you've spoken harshly with others or other things like this when you've been aggressive and hostile and bitter through your intentions your speech and your actions that produces unwholesome results for you because in those moments you didn't have the intention of harmlessness and you didn't have the intention of non-ill will or goodwill so by practicing doing no harm where you're not interested in causing harm you'll be able to promote more healthy and harmonious relationships and get to more peace and joy. Because as long as you're causing harm in the world, harm is gonna come back to you and it's gonna be very challenging to get to peace and joy if you're experiencing harm coming back to you. So this not causing harm is something that is underlying all the teachings of the Buddha. But in the unenlightened state, because of the lack of wisdom of these natural laws that the Buddha taught, you may think that you have all the best intentions in the world. You may think that you're speaking and acting in all the best ways, but because of your lack of wisdom and you just don't know what you don't know, you're actually making decisions that are potentially unwise and are producing unwholesome results. Sometimes when something blows up in our face and you're like, oh my goodness, why did this just happen? You might think that you have all the best intentions and you might think that you're speaking or acting in all the best ways. And then you realize that and you might start blaming other people for what you're experiencing. But if you understand the natural laws and what the Buddha taught, you can clearly see in those situations, you weren't practicing the wise decision-making around your intentions, your speech, and your actions. But with a lack of wisdom, you won't see those things. So there's a core central teaching that the Buddha shares. It's called the Eightfold Path. And I taught that over three individual sessions at the beginning of this group learning program. And I also teach it as part of uh, chapter four and five in the first book. So when we get to that in the next few weeks, I'm gonna be uh, teaching that again. But the Eightfold Path is a core central teaching where you learn about wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline to be able to build your life practice to the point where you understand the natural laws and that you're making wise decisions around your moral conduct and the way that you interact with other beings. Because as long as you have a lack of wisdom of these natural laws, you'll tend to make unwise decisions without even realizing it. And this is where I think about prior to getting on the path to enlightenment, it's almost like walking through the forest, knocking down a whole bunch of trees and burning up the forest. And we're just plowing through the forest, kind of attending to our own selfish desires. And we start smelling smoke and we look back and we see all these trees are knocked down and we're like, who knocked down all the trees? Where is that smoke coming from? Who lit the fire? 
we don't realize that we did those things, right? That we damaged those relationships, that we caused those difficulties. It's not about blame or who's at fault, because I'm sure in situation that there's other people that are doing things that are unwise too, that are around you. But as long as you're blaming other people and pointing out other people's problems, you're not attending to the things that you need to develop and the wisdom that you need to cultivate. So what this path is about is focusing you on your development and understanding that it's your decisions that are leading to any particular result, not about blame or fault, but just looking to cultivate wisdom and be able to make wiser and wiser decisions around how we interact with other beings in the world. And this second universal uh, teaching that you'll see amongst all teachings, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, Muslim teachings, Judaism, or anything else, is about not causing harm to other beings. Because as long as you're causing harm through your intentions, your speech, your actions, even your livelihood and the way that you choose to sustain your life, if you're causing harm through any of these things, this harm is going to come back to you. So the Buddha, again, he's not teaching rules and commandments, but he's showing you through your intentions, your speech, your actions, and your livelihood, ways that you could cause harm. And then if you learn these things and you practice them, then you'll be able to see that you're causing less and less harm. And then you're experiencing more and more improved results in your life. You're experiencing more and more wholesome results because you're making wiser and wiser decisions around your conduct and the way you interact in the world. So practicing non-ill will or goodwill and practicing harmlessness is to do no harm. And now with that intention and what you're actually working towards, now you practice being a good moral person. And in the teachings of the Buddha, he explains this through right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So if you have the intention or the thinking of doing no harm and you're disinterested in doing harm and you realize any painful feelings that you're experiencing is coming from within your own mind, now you can work on developing your moral conduct where you speak and you act and you have a certain livelihood where you're not causing harm and you can cultivate this wisdom through learning it, through reflecting on it to independently verify it and practice it. And now through being a good Good moral person making wise decisions around your moral conduct you'll experience improved results coming back to you in your relationships so there's a whole path that the buddha taught that you can learn but this is just a little bit of a summary of the way to look at the teachings of the buddha but also relating that to other teachings too whether it's christianity or muslim teachings or hinduism or uh, judaism or any of these different traditions that you might see in the world you can see these same commonalities they might describe them differently but they're actually teaching the same underlying thing so for example like some of you might be familiar with jesus christ teachings you know he taught love thy neighbor where the Buddha taught, have loving kindness and compassion for all beings. You know, Jesus Christ taught, you reap what you sow, right? The Buddha taught the natural law of karma, cause and effect or action and result. You know, the, Jesus taught about this Holy Spirit and getting this Holy Spirit. Uh, the Buddha taught enlightenment and getting to this in mental state of enlightenment. So you could go through any number of these teachings. If you look at Muslim teachings, uh, Prophet Muhammad, he taught about generosity and sharing with the people around you. The Buddha taught these things too because it helps you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, where you're not holding on to things, wanting them to be permanent. If you look at Muslim teachings, they even taught uh, prayer five times a day. There's a certain amount of inner discipline that needs to happen in order for you to pray five times a day in the Muslim tradition. And in order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to have dedication and diligence and determination to have that inner discipline to meditate uh, a few times a day and to learn the teachings and develop your life practice. So you can look at each one of these things, whether it's Hinduism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, Judaism, you can see a lot of commonalities. The more you understand the path to enlightenment that the Buddha taught, it might actually help you to understand more about what you might have been learning as a child. If you grew up with any of these different traditions, the more that you learn the teachings of the Buddha, you'll probably understand Jesus' teachings better or Prophet Muhammad's teachings better or Hindu teachings better or Judaism better. Uh, the more you understand like, oh, this is what I need to do to get to enlightenment. And you start seeing that it's actually working and you're like, oh yeah, I was learning that over here when I was 10 years old. That's very similar to what I was learning. It was just different language. It was being described differently, but it's very similar. So in my opinion, it's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's not that Hinduism is all right or all wrong or Christianity is all right or all wrong or Muslim teachings are all right or all wrong or any of these other things. It's about finding what works best for you. 
in terms of like if you went to a college and you were taking a program on marketing, for example, or you were a business major and you had different professors that were teaching you about marketing. Well, maybe you had two or three or four different professors that were teaching you about marketing. There's professor A, professor B, professor C, and professor D. Well, maybe for you, professor A was really, really helpful for you and really helped you to develop your understanding of marketing really well. But maybe for me, it was professor B, right? And maybe for somebody else, it was Professor C or Professor D, right? And it's not that Professor A is all wrong or all right, or Professor C is all wrong or all right, but Professor B for me really, you know, really helped me to understand marketing and really communicated it in a way that I could understand and really implement what it was that they were teaching. And for each individual person, a certain professor, a certain teacher is going to be more impactful to the other. So what I suggest people to do is they find a teacher and they find a set of teachings and a collection of teachings that really speaks to you and someone that you can have access to, to learn through those resources, to get access to that person, to be able to help you and guide you on your journey in life. Because it's not that Christianity is all right or all wrong or any of these other things are all right or all wrong. It's about finding an individual and finding a collection of teachings that speaks to you and that allows you to be able to see a path forward to becoming a better and better human being. And for me, the teachings of the Buddha do that. The teachings of the Buddha are very clear. They're very concise. They're very precise. He explains to you exactly what you need to do. He provides you the the tools and the techniques to be able to train your mind. And then it's up to you to make your own individual decisions. You're on your own independent journey to enlightenment. It's not about there's one person at the top and then they disseminate teachings and then everybody has to follow those rules and commandments. That's not what the Buddha did. Instead, he's explaining to you the natural laws around you. He's explaining to you the natural world and he's inviting you to investigate and examine his teachings so that you can see the natural laws. Because when you live in a world that you don't understand, you will struggle. You will have difficulties because you don't understand the world that you live in. So the Buddha is teaching you about this natural world and helping you to understand what's happening with your own mind and what's happening in the world around you. And when you're learning, reflecting, and practicing, you're independently verifying his teachings. You gain more and more wisdom about this natural world around you. And now you'll make wiser and wiser decisions that are producing more and more wholesome results. So if you're interested in learning the teachings of the Buddha, I'm here to help you. Everything that I provide is available at no cost, whether it's the books or the classes or courses, retreats, the audiobooks, the personal guidance, anything that you need. I'm here to help you with unconditional love without any expectations of anything in return. I'm here to help you to experience this enlightened mental state and move away from the sadness and anger and frustration and all these other discontent feelings. And understand that if you grew up with any type of teachings at all, any particular tradition or just learning from grandma and grandpa or mom or dad, all those things are building blocks to help you get to where you are today. And there's never a time where me or someone in our community is going to say, hey, are you ready to convert to Buddhism, right? There's no such thing as converting to Buddhism, right? There's no such thing as that. In terms of an identity of I am Buddhist, the Buddha himself wasn't Buddhist, right? So you don't need to adopt this label of I am a Buddhist, This needs to be eliminated from the mind. So the Buddha, nor I, or anyone who's gotten to enlightenment, they don't have in their mind this label of I am Buddhist. So if you consider yourself Christian or Hindu or Muslim or any other of these different types of traditions, wonderful. You know, use those things to strengthen you and help you become a better and better person. And if you're interested in using these universal teachings of universal love of all beings, do no harm and be a good moral person and use this bridge to kind of bridge over to being able to start learning the teachings of the Buddha, they're here to help you. There's no rites or rituals or ceremonies or worship in the teachings of the Buddha. It's all about inner growth and inner development. One of the ways that I think about the teachings of the Buddha is it's like the best, most helpful self-help program you'll ever find. It's a well-vetted program that's been around for 2,500 years, and it's been around that long because it works, right? So it's all about your own inner development and your own growth. And you'll need teachers and guides to be able to help you along that path.
So this is just a short little bit, everything that I was going to share with you guys today about this particular topic. Sometimes the different topics that I talk about take a longer time to discuss. But what I'm going to do is just see if you guys have any questions about anything that I've shared or any thing that you would like to talk about, about what I shared or even anything that's in your own mind about the teachings of the Buddha. You're welcome to ask any and all questions or even other traditions as well. You're welcome to ask those questions. So here at the temple or online, if you guys would like to ask any questions, just let me know. You guys have any questions here? Yes, sir. If you could uh, get a mic here and you can take it back to your seat because there might be other people that need it around you as well. Um, yeah, I was just curious. Um, before you started practicing, were you any other faith or what was your upbringing as a child? Sure. When I was... Uh, Growing up, my parents never, uh, you know, required me to do anything religious or traditional things like that. But I was curious myself about many different teachings. So I went to many different churches. I grew up in the USA. So I went to Mormon churches, Presbyterian churches, Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, Baptist churches, you know, you name it. I was in and out of those things. I even had some exposure to Judaism and Muslim teachings at different times. So I kind of explored all these different things um, and never quite understood. Um, but then ultimately, by the time I started understanding or, or being exposed to the teachings of the Buddha, I understood. And then that actually helped me to understand all the other things that I'd been learning growing up. But my parents never uh, required us to do anything. There wasn't like a the family going to church kind of thing in our home. It was just kind of like you do whatever you'd like to do. Uh, my sister, she was baptized Lutheran. But for me, my family just let me make whatever choices I would like to make. And because of that, I ended up going to lots of different things and exploring lots of different things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions you guys have, either here or online? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. All right, well, I'll just end class then if you guys don't have any questions. Um, so we have classes here on Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Sunday and Wednesday is the group learning program. This is a foundational program to help students get started on the journey to enlightenment. You can attend here at the temple or you can attend online. And I teach these classes at 9 a.m. Thai time and 9 p.m. as well. And I'm live streaming. So no matter where you are in the world, you should be able to find a, a live class. So like right now would be what, Saturday evening in North America and Central America and South America. And then I'm also going to teach this evening at 9 p.m., which will be Sunday morning for that same time zone. And then they're also recorded. So if you can't make the classes live, you can also watch the recording. So a combination of reading the first book and attending the classes and receiving any kind of help that you like, you can get help through posting in our Facebook group, and I will provide you an answer there. You can ask questions in class. You can send a private message, or you can schedule personal guidance and I will help you. So the Sunday, Wednesday classes are ideal for someone just getting started. On Saturdays, we have our Pali Canon and English study group where we study the words of the Buddha more as a study group versus a traditional style of learning. That's a program that students usually move into after they develop a foundation in the path to enlightenment. And then we have various courses and retreats throughout the month and throughout the year. We have one called Foundation in the Path to Enlightenment. We have Harmony and Relationships, Experiencing the Jhanas and the Four Stages of enlightenment. We have various retreats that we have. They're all available through our website. If you look at our website, you'll see all the options there. Our website's buddhadailywisdom.com. We even have some of that stuff over here on our bulletin board as well. So you're welcome to check into all of those things because they're here to help you to be able to learn and grow and develop and move closer and closer to the enlightened mental state. So if there's anything you guys would like help with, just let me know. I'm here to help you. Perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadikab. Sawadikab.
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.